Good evening. How's everyone doing? Good. Figure if you're not responding, that means your mouth is still full, so that's not a bad thing. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Justin Leffler. I'm one of the volunteers here at FISH, Friends in Service of Heroes. Um, Paul is actually out of town. We let him have a vacation, but I think after tonight we're going to say that he's not allowed to take vacations on the third Thursdays anymore. Um, lots of stuff going on with FISH. Um, how many of you are familiar with Friends in Service of Heroes? Perfect. For those of you who are not, um, Friends in Service of Heroes started about 13 years ago as the food industry serving heroes. Um, it all started around the idea of wanting to feed our heroes, the soldiers, uh, sailors, Marines, anyone that signed on the dotted line to write a blank check for our country and raise their right hand and put on the clock for our country. Uh, so since then, it has grown uh, more and more every, literally every day. I feel like we're on the phone talking about something, uh, another veteran or active duty service member that needs help. Uh, if you have not already, please go in, follow us on all of our social media platforms. Instagram at Friends and Service of Heroes. Um, Facebook is the big one where we're going to be posting a lot of events, uh, many updates, and a lot of great activities in, in people's lives that we're changing. Um, also, American Legion Post 370, a uh, big shout out to the post here um, for allowing us to post this uh, in their hall. Um, we also have an American Legion Riders post. I see some uh, leather vests out here, so big shout out to those guys. A lot of them will do honor missions, um, you know, helping the heroes on their final uh, ride to their resting place. Um, so we'll see a lot of that happening. Next up. So really, this all started around the monthly speaker series. It's not only about recognizing and, uh, and honoring our heroes, but it's about learning from us specifically the younger generations. So I know uh, our speaker tonight is going to be giving a lot of great information, but a lot of these things that are coming down um, in the speaker series, um, it's really critical for us to be able to share and pass that knowledge on to the next generation of heroes that are going to be putting themselves on the line for our country. So being able to do that, uh, I mean, it's kind of like twofold, because on the other side, we've heard... Um, from speakers in the past, a lot of times it's, it's really healing for them. Um, many times it's the first time they've ever shared their stories, whether it was from Vietnam, Somalia. We've, we've heard a lot of great um, stories, very inspirational, very moving, um, very eye water uh, about what really goes on. So we do several reoccurring events on, on a monthly basis. Um, FISH, our Fireside 180 Veterans Group, is the third Wednesday. This happened yesterday at Ash Handel down in Gardner, Kansas. If you like cigars, it's a great place to be. Um, but also, it's more of a, it's, a, it's based on God. Um, so we're, we're pulling from from the spiritual side to help with the healing. It's a safe place. Everything stays there at the fire. Um, completely confidential, but it's, it's another form of healing, camaraderie, and, and ways for just to, you know, whatever you may be going through. If, if it's personal issues with your spouse or loved ones or you know, something you just need help with, you have a support group there to help you and really just kind of carry you through that. So there's so many different Fireside 180 groups can, can really just bring people together and, and help you heal. Wow, so this is a good one. Who was here for our Christmas party last year? What, what, would you recommend it? Would you? Okay. So just some quick highlights. Last year, um, we had 
some special guests here. Um, anyone know who that was? So what you're saying is like a uh, badass Chiefs player. Am I, am I allowed to say that? I just did. Um, uh, Noah Gray was here last year, so um, there's a couple other people that might be um, coming to spread some love and Christmas cheer, but of course Santa Claus always comes. And the, in, in the spirit of fish, what we do um, and how we do it, we call it fishing. Because real veterans, people that really need the help, we're too proud to ask for help. You don't want to ask for help. It's like, I'm, I'm a man, I'm tough, I'm supposed to be able to handle this. And a lot of people don't want to ask for help because it makes them look weak and it's, you know, it's just a really tough thing to go through. Um, so what we do is we go fishing. We find those, um, those veterans and also active duty. Um, so we have contacts at Fort Riley, Fort Leonard Wood, uh, Fort Leavenworth, and all of a sudden, uh, these, uh, these soldiers, you know, get orders from their CEO to, why am I going to the American Legion on November 30th? And, well, they do what they're told. So they come down here and, and we bless them. So um, depending on their family and what they're going through, um, we have some great uh, sponsors that help us out with this. But, but really, um, last year we gave away $30,500 in gift cards right up here in front of the stage to active duty servicemen that, that, need, that needed some love. <laughs> On top of that, we gave over $4,000 uh, to Fort Leavenworth VA domiciliary to, for them to be able to help you know, their people up on the base. So just being able to constantly give back and just a way to recognize them. Everyone struggles, um, especially with the prices these days. I mean, it, it hurts, it's painful. We've all felt that at the grocery store, the gas pumps, anything, our cable bills, whatever bill we're paying, we're feeling that. And we don't, we don't want them to feel that pressure when they're already doing so much for our country. Um, we also blessed uh, the MPs up at the prison up there. Um, but that, that's just some of the stuff that we're doing right there. So November 30th, everyone is welcome. It's gonna be absolutely amazing. So if you're here, available, there might be food, there might be a bunch of special guests up here, um, but it's, it's really something that changes you. Um, also on the horizon, as far as fish events and what we're doing, um, so this past month, um, actually let me back up, a few months back um, in May, uh, Jeremiah Bull, one of our fish volunteers, um, who led us in the prayer and blessing before we ate, um, him and Luis, another fish volunteer, they were down at Fort Leonard Wood delivering food to the, the food pantry down there. Believe it or not, the active bases still have food banks that the active duty servicemen and women need, need to get food from. Um, that's another thing that FISH does. We stock that for our bases. Um, they went down there and they met a, a double amputee, Staff Sergeant Barnes. And, and he had a lot of property, avid hunter, outdoorsman. Um, well, on October 1st, they realized that he didn't have a, he needed a track chair. Um, so there was a whole team of FISH volunteers. We went to the Royals game on October 1st. So before the game, um, the Royals let us drive a brand new track chair out onto the field, um, and he came out there, and, and we surprised him right in the middle of the final home game of the season. I was standing with his family, and his wife was speechless, and she just said, oh my God, and just started shaking her head, and, and she was tearing up. That was moving. That's what Fish does. Um, out there on the field, you know, that's, he, was, he lost both of his legs in an RPG, and he, he, he gave him his life back. He could be with his family and friends again, um, enjoy the outdoors. Um, that was a great event. Um, man, there's just so much here. Um, I'm trying not to take away from the, our speaker's time here too much, but tomorrow and Saturday, um, if you guys are going to be down by the Lake of the Ozarks, by chance, um, 
Charlie Foxtrots. The bar down there, um, Bound and Determined, is going to be doing a live uh, performance uh, fundraising for fish down there. So if you're down there, stop by, so show some love and support. Um, also, um, we all love dogs. How many people have dogs? Okay. October 28th at Bar K. So we, Bar K has partnered with Smithfield Foods. Um, we've shared that on our social media posts, but they're going to be doing a fundraiser all day. Bring your dogs, have fun, come out there, support fish, and, and do everything you can to, to show the love over there. Um, wow. I feel like I'm missing something. Am I? I get, I get through everything? Oh, does he want to talk? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, real quick, are there any veterans in here that did not get an orange ticket? Because it is going to be crazy here in a little bit. Do you guys figure out who those are? Keep your hands up and I'm going to keep talking and uh, finish this up right quick. Okay, that's him. So, I have the privilege and honor of introducing Lieutenant Colonel Greg Shuey, United States Air Force retired. Lieutenant Colonel Shuey served 25 years in the U.S. Air Force as a combat fighter pilot, instructor and test pilot with 2,900 hours and 13 aircrafts. He flew 350 combat missions in Vietnam with a follow-on career as a war planner, satellite engineering manager, Air Force Director of Engineering for the Space Shuttle at Johnson Space Center and as a negotiator to the Korean government for U.S. Forces Korea. He was the founder of two international companies and several high-tech companies in the U.S. He also served as Associate Professor for Mathematics and Physics for three universities. He is a graduate of the Air Force Academy with a degree in space physics and holds master's degrees in biochemical engineering with a minor in astrogeophysics and a master's in business administration. He is also a graduate of the U.S. Air Force's Squadron Officer School, the Air Command and Staff College, and the Air War College. Colonel Shuey was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross 13 air medals, two Vietnamese crosses of gallantry, and 13 other decorations for his combat and military service. He has six children, four of which to have served seven tours in the Middle East wars. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Colonel Shuey to the stage. Thank you, Justin. to increase his public affairs fee. <laughs> that one, okay. great. So, uh, let's see, the topic tonight is football this weekend, right? <laughs> when Air Force takes on Navy and Army in a couple of weeks, it's gonna be fun. You guys are gonna have a little bit of trouble because finally we can pass the ball. So uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on KCAOG, Kansas City Association of Graduates of the Air Force Academy. Excuse me if I talk fast. I'm going to try to get through this 13 pages in the next uh, 20 minutes. Um, but um, our organization was formed 15 years ago, and we got three founders here tonight, myself, Mr. Virg Stepanski, raise your hand, Virgil, thank you, and, and Mr. Wendell Harkel Road, back there someplace, both football players. So, you know, we do have smart guys that go to the academy, but some of them do end up playing football, so what can I say? <laughs> but anyway, these are great guys. We've been involved in this thing for 15 years. <laughs> um, I also want to introduce quickly, if you'll just stand up. We've got a, graduates from um, the Army uh, Military Academy from West Point. Will you all stand up, please? Thank you very much. Hate to say it, we also have some Navy guys around here from Annapolis. Would you please stand up? Thank you so much. <laughs> Mr. Culler back there is the president of the association, so he lets me play golf with him sometimes. And then we also have the Air Force Academy. I'd like to introduce those guys because we also have some special guests tonight, and I want them to know who's here from the academy. Please, everybody from there.
<laughs> and finally, we've got uh, some cadets. I'm up here in a dual role of uh, giving the speech, of course, but I'm also in my 20th year, and tonight I've brought some candidates from the Air Force Academy that I'm mentoring. I'm, I'm a liaison for the Academy. I have 38 schools and a lot of kids that are really talented, that are interested in going, and uh, several of them are here tonight. Would you please stand up? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> you've heard the reputation of the Air Force building the, <clears throat> the golf course first and then the officers club and then the runway. Well, that's because the Army and the Navy are jealous. The Army, when they go out and clear something for the, uh, for the golf course, they blow it up. So you have all these bunkers, you know, and you really can't play golf very well with 97 bunkers out there. And the Navy is just jealous because they can't put a fairway and a, and a tee on an aircraft carrier. So anytime you guys want to come and play on our courses, you're more than welcome. We enjoy that. We actually have uh, golf tournaments about twice a year. And uh, anybody who is in favor of our military, in favor of, you know, likes, supports, really wants to be protected by, you're, you're invited to come to all of our events. And we do all of our events jointly with the Army and the Air Force. So um, I want to start with this one. Actually, <clears throat> you've, um, you've heard the reputation of fighter pilots who who say they always start a story with, once upon a time, and this isn't no bull. Well, <clears throat> I'm a fighter pilot. There so, I was. there I was. <laughs> so, once upon a time, and this is no bull. Uh, there was a young boy who lost his dad when he was five years old. His grandparents came over and, and lived with him uh, in the brand new house that dad built before um, he passed on. And grandma used to take the, the young lad out to watch the stars at night. And he got very interested in astronomy to the point that he knew he wanted to be something uh, associated with astronomy. And then during the summertime, Flash Gordon was the TV show. Remember Flash Gordon, the old heads did? <clears throat> well, Flash Gordon would go around the universe fighting the Emperor Ming with this beautiful Dale Arden on his shoulder, flying this cool little spacecraft that interestingly had smoke coming out of it, just like the Lionel train that this young man used to have. He couldn't figure that out. It's the simple, these guys are in space and the train's down here. So anyway, uh, being a space cadet was, was really something that was very interested to him. So he studied very hard. Eighth grade came along. He, he won an award with all the teachers voting on him. His picture was in the paper. And a colonel called him up and said, hey, I'd like to invite you to a party. It was a Christmas party. He went. There were. Uh, young college kids there in this beautiful blue uniform turned out to be the first class of the Air Force Academy, 1959 graduates, soon to be graduates. <clears throat> so the kids said, hey, this is pretty cool. What's the Academy about? The Colonel said, well, let me tell you this, son. <clears throat> Here's what you need to do. So for the next four years, the kid did exactly that. Well, this is <clears throat> that young man with his ALO. It wasn't the Colonel. The Colonel was the regional liaison officer. This was Colonel Major Stevens. And Major Stevens said, you do these things so that for the next four years he did it. Guess what? Senior year, got a presidential nomination. President Johnson, who had been vice president, promoted up. He got to do the appointments. And the kid went to the academy. And so first year, and guess who he met? Wendell Harkerode. We've been friends for uh, how many years now? How many decades? <laughs> uh, Wendell was a first classman. I was a dually. We didn't have friendship then. It came later. But anyway, we've, we've been great friends ever since. So for four years, we did all this sort of stuff. And have you noticed right there that the kid is in the academy brochure as a pianist? I didn't play football. wasn't big enough. But I knew how to play the piano. So I was the accompanist for the choir and the chorale. <clears throat> and then a few years later, after graduation, on the cover of Aviation Week and Space Technology magazine, there he is again, twice. Well, and then a couple of years after that, flying the A-10 again, a couple of years after that, into NASA with the space program. So what's the point of this? I give speeches to junior high school students and high school students. The speech is called, What's Your Dream? And I tell the kids, look, you've got a whole future ahead of you, but it's going to be wandering back and forth through failed uh, situations unless you have a dream. You've got to figure out where you want to go. And a dream is nothing more than a wish unless you put a goal against it. And the goal is nothing more than a, an enhanced wish unless you have a timeline 
and you put an action plan together. Well, by accident, I actually put an, an action plan together. And these kids here tonight have done the same sort of thing. They have put their, their applications in for the Air Force Academy. Why would they do that? It's a $500,000 scholarship. All the books, tuition, meals, transportation, medical, dental, everything is covered for the next four years, plus you get a half of a second lieutenant salary or a, an ensign salary. You get a guaranteed job for at least five years, nine years if you're gonna be a pilot. So that's why I've spent the last 20 years trying to educate kids to find those who are dedicated to become the future long blue line. And I also help if they're interested in getting dirt in their teeth, sending them to West Point. Or if they really like to swim, sending them to Annapolis. We're, we're kind of generic in that respect. So I, I support all of the, the academies. We have all kinds of events. But my point is, I had a dream. I made it happen, just like you would do if you had a business plan in your company. And so I, I, I try to get these kids to think far enough ahead and do something with their life rather than stand there and do video games all the time. So that's my ALO speech tonight. Okay, let's talk about the STS. This is the most marvelous piece of equipment I ever ran against. Absolutely an engineering marvel from the, from the very beginning. <clears throat> it was the first reusable shuttle spacecraft and a, a spacecraft that was designed to go to orbit and bring stuff back. Now, Apollo was the end of NASA's career. Its, cha its charter was to take somebody to the moon. When it did that and finished and Nixon canceled the whole thing, NASA had no place to go. And they had tens of thousands of high tech engineers, the best space people in the business. And they were led by bureaucrats. So what do bureaucrats do? They find a way to stay in, in business, right? Well, in this case, it was a smart idea. We needed to have some way to send all kinds of satellites and, and different kinds of experiments into space. So NASA came up with the idea of a space transportation system, STS. They wanted literally, literally to be a commercial concern, but the shuttle was always experimental, so they were never able to get there. And it was their fault because it was always changing, and it was a very, very complicated piece of equipment. <clears throat> Notice there were a million piece parts on this thing, and there are 100 single point failures. Now, a single point failure is if a part or a subsystem or a system fails, it's catastrophic. There's no way to, to fix it. The, the whole mission is done. We know about two of those, right? So industry and NASA goes to great extent to make sure those single point failures don't happen. Unfortunately, they can't create all the safety factors for somebody making a bad decision. And that's what happened with Challenger and eventually with Columbia. <clears throat> the, the shuttle was designed with 100 uh, missions. We had five flyable. Uh, shuttle sh should have had 500 missions. We only had 135. It was too expensive, $209 billion. <clears throat> But the aircraft, the spacecraft, was designed to be, I have a rocket up there. Technically, it's a missile. A rocket is unguided. This one has controls to fly wherever you want it. So it's a rocket to space. It's a satellite uh, in space. And it's a, well, you call it an airplane. It's a flying rock coming back down. But at least it guides itself like a glider. <clears throat> there are six total uh, planes built, the first two, Enterprise and uh, Columbia. Enterprise never had the engines in it, and never had uh, sufficient heat shield, so it, it never flew. Columbia, or excuse me, uh, Challenger, not Columbia. Challenger uh, was eventually upgraded to a flight vehicle, but the first three that were really designed were Atlantis, Columbia, and Discovery. Uh, when Challenger blew up, uh, Enterprise was built to take its place. And by the way, <coughs> uh, this is the, uh, the 747 that was used to fly this, this puppy, uh, Bob Crippen and Joe Engel, who I flew a mission with in the shuttle simulator, were, were the captive crew. They, they basically rode the, the uh, 747 back and did all the test equipment. And then finally, they did five of the free, free fall uh, flights. So uh, this was the first spacecraft to go up to orbit and bring stuff back. Flew a lot of missions. 
uh, a lot of days in space, carried most of the people. Initially, it was about a billion and a half bucks per flight. Eventually, it got down to about 450 uh, million per flight. And of course, with two crews of seven each, we lost seven. Now, there's something called a, a MTBF, mean time, before, uh, mean time Before Failure. And that's a percentage, or a, basically the number of, of fails that you should get in a block, like one in a thousand. So that would be 0.01%, right? Well, if you have a million pieces on board, and you only have a failure rate of one per 100 mission, which is what the shuttle had, then all of those pieces have to be added together so that you only have one lost flight per mission. I mean, that's the probability that they, they compute. So that means all of these piece parts have to be very, very carefully built and, and bound not to fail. <clears throat> I had 14 opportunities in mission control. Uh, it was a great uh, experience right there. In, we, the Air Force had our own back room, but I could go out in the in mission co control area. So when I see Apollo 13, that's the real uh, Johnson Space Center. Um, I was almost in the movie Space, but I had some other things, and they put the lieutenants up there, so it's okay. <clears throat> but uh, uh, I was on the sixth Discovery, the Challenger, the Atlantis of Columbia, the first and last uh, Challenger mission. The satellite repair mission, I got to work a little bit with Cassidy Sullivan. When you're going out and take something out of the, of the shuttle, you gotta un, unhook uh, panels, right? Well, if you use a power uh, bolt uh, retriever, guess what? When you turn that puppy on, you rotate around the, <laughs> the, the device. So NASA had to develop tech tools that they could go up and that would not have that, that rotation problem. So there was much more involved and much more complicated procedures when you started fixing uh, vehicles and, and Sullivan was one of the first to do that. Then we got to Hubble and they, they were proficient by that time when they repaired that mission. We also had the very first classified DOD mission. Everything that NASA flew that was classified was at the above top secret level. I had top secret for 25 years. I still couldn't get in. Uh, my my uh, up uh, clearance was being upgraded when uh, Walker was caught and they canceled all uh, clearances from then on. So I never got to see what was inside the pay payload, but we know they're basically spy satellites. Okay, so about the STS. <clears throat> Space transportation system consists of three parts. The orbiter, which you call the shuttle, the solid rocket boosters, and the external tank. Uh, it's big. It's more than half the length of a football field. Not as big as the Saturn V that sat outside my window, which was 363 feet long, laying on its side. That was a real monster, almost twice the size. <clears throat> but still, this is almost the size of a 747, as you saw in that, that previous picture. Four and a half million pounds of weight that has to be thrown into space at 17,000 plus miles an hour. That requires 7.7 .7 million pounds of thrust. If it was equal, you'd never get up, right? <laughs> and you could carry a max of 63,000, but it ne they never went above 50,000. 50, <clears throat> this is what this puppy looks like. The external tank, which is, used to be painted white, but they saved 600 pounds by getting rid of the paint, the SRBs, and of course the shuttle. That's a, I think that's discovery. Uh, let's talk uh, about some of the components because there's some interesting stories associated with this. You've got two solid rocket boosters, 150 feet in length, basically. Again, half the size of a football field. Uh, they're 12.17 feet wide. And that's important. By the way, there'll be a test later. <laughs> and it really is whether or not you can find that ticket of yours, okay? <clears throat> it weighs 1.3 million pounds, but most of that is propellant, 1.1 million. And uh, it produces the majority, 83% of the weights, uh, 5.6 to 6.2 million pounds, and the difference, is the difference in the atmosphere. Bony burns for 124 seconds. Why? Because it's a Roman candle. Once the propellant's gone, ain't no more. And so why keep it? You don't want to keep it. You throw it away. OK, so <clears throat> that's what it looks like, built in, in uh, sections. Propellant, 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 propellant. One, two, three. Three sections where something called the O-ring, which you probably remember exists. There are two O-rings in each one of these compartments. 
There's a guy in Kansas City in 1920 named Joseph Potok, who was a scientist, and he was trying to make uh, antifreeze. Well, he failed, like many scientists do, you know, playing around with chemicals and mix it here and there and see what comes up. He made a slurry that turned into a rubbery substance that didn't have any value at the time. JPL found it years later, worked with Thiokol, gave it to them, or somehow it got over there. Thiokol decided, hey, this is a great binder to put in with the oxidizer and the fuel and make a solid rocket booster. They made the Minuteman with it. So SRB is son of Minuteman. That's how they make it. They have a 600-gallon drum, and they pour this stuff in. It's ammonium uh, perchlorate uh, and uh, uh, powdered aluminum, believe it or not, that's the fuel, <clears throat> and then this, this slurry, and they put it into this cast and make each one of these. Now there's something else interesting about this. Uh, <clears throat> that's the SRB thrust, that's the main engine thrust. Notes, notice the difference, 6.2 million pounds versus about 1.2. Well, <clears throat> that's for a reason, because you've got to get all of this mass up into space quickly as fast as you can, and then you get rid of the SRBs, and now you've got the external tank and the main engine still pushing it to the, the uh, orbital velocity. Note that, oh, this one. <clears throat> Note that the, the thrust vector is straight down the longitudinal axis of the vehicle. It means it's gonna go straight up. Well, if you throw something, oops, if you throw something straight up, it's gonna come straight down, right? So what you wanna do is, get our pitch and roll program to push the shuttle over to the side to get into elliptical orbit. And you do that because the main engines are canted. So this is how you get directional control with the orbit. Now notice, you got little flame there, one there, these are shock waves. There's only 1.2 million pounds of thrust coming out of these things. This is liquid hydrogen and oxygen. It burns very cleanly. You can't even see it when it's actually on fire which is dangerous around the, the bucket. <clears throat> this has all kinds of particulate matter that's still burning as it comes out. That's why the difference between the two engines. <clears throat> uh, the external tank is nothing more than a great big gas bag filled with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Hydrogen at the lower section, O2 at the top, and then there's a, a middle section in there that absorbs all the energy when the shuttle is shaking, rattling, and rolling. It's also very big, uh, the biggest component. Very fragile, 58,000 pounds empty, but you got uh, 1.68 million pounds of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. At 423 degrees below zero, absolute zero is 459, and liquid oxygen at 297. Very cold, very big thermal problem. That's why you have this red stuff on the outside, hydrochlorofluoral carbon, which is a foam that tends to break off. It's not a good idea, but NASA never fixed it, unfortunately. <clears throat> this is what this thing looks like. Notice there's not really very much to hold on to, especially with a shuttle, so it, it releases pretty easily. It separates at 300,000 feet. It's got so much energy, it's 17,000 miles an hour at that point. It sails up to 668,000 feet before losing everything and falling back to Earth. And the velocity is so much that it breaks up in the atmosphere, disintegrates in pieces, and falls into the ocean. So this is not reused. The main engine is extremely interesting because this is the first uh, liquid hydrogen oxygen engine that was <coughs> designed to be reusable and throttleable if that's a word, you can adjust it from 60 to 100% power. <clears throat> uh, only 400 to 490,000 pounds of thrust per engine, but that's all you need to get the rest of the speed for the shuttle. Pretty expensive, it burns for 510 seconds. Why? Because you run out of gas. The external ca uh, tanks are, are empty by that point. That's called MECO, main engine cutoff. <clears throat> and it, uh, the, the pump that's on top of this puppy develops 75,000 horsepower. Now, you kids in physics, are you in physics? Okay, uh, horsepower is, is work, correct? Force times the distance. 
One horsepower is 550 pounds moved one foot in one second. 75,000 of them in that pump. The main engines themselves produce 37 million pounds of thrust, of, uh, of horsepower. And the total with the external tank produces 82 million horsepower. This is one big uh, piece of equipment. So <clears throat> when we launched this puppy, we're burning seven tons of fuel a second between the SRBs and the, uh, and the main engines. So in uh, 124 seconds, you're going to burn off 2.2 million pounds of solid propellant, and you're going to burn off 1.63 million pounds in eight and a half minutes. And then you're going to start burning up the hydrazine that's on board the shuttle uh, to circulate the orbit. Okay, so how do we put this thing together? Well, they had to build a special um, 747. They had to put structures in here. They had to extend the, the uh, horizontal stabili stabilizer and put the rudders out here because the shuttle is such a big hunk of drag. It's basically a huge speed brake. It blocks out the airflow back here. So the rudder that you would normally have for yaw capability doesn't work. Notice that this is at a high angle of attack. If the airplane is flying straight and level, <clears throat> the angle of attack is basically zero, theoretically, because that's the flight and that's where the nose is pointed. When it goes up like this, that's the flight direction. That's where the nose is pointed. That's the angle of attack. It has to do this because of, of the drag that the shuttle has. If it didn't do that, it wouldn't be able to fly straight and level. The external tank is built in uh, New Orleans and it's put in this huge barge shipped around the Cape. <clears throat> this is where it is inside the, uh, the vertical assembly building, which I have been in at the very top on the catwalk, walking across in, with a steel grate looking straight down 525 feet. That's a little scary, and I jumped out of airplanes. So even, you know, that's a little bit unnerving. But this thing is so big that you could actually put the Saturn V in it, which is what they did, <coughs> and still have room. It's so big that it has its own weather system on the inside. You have clouds. <coughs> uh, 143 million cubic feet of space. There are four bays, so theoretically you could build four shuttles at the same time, which they never did. Um, they only have two crawlers and they only have three launch platforms, so they're limited in other means in any, any case. Note this little guy. That's how big that, that uh, external tank is. He's just a, a midget relative to the size of the thing. This is where uh, the, the oxygen tank is. Right in here, there's this, this third dummy tank, and that's where the liquid, the liquid hydrogen is. So <clears throat> they bring it in. They haul it up vertically. They've got a 250-ton uh, crane that lifts all this equipment up to the, to the very top. They bring the, uh, the crawler in with the mobile platform on top of it, which you'll see later. It's already about uh, 50 feet high by the time they get the whole thing put together. They put the two SRBs on it. They lock them down with eight bolts each. And the bolts, that's pretty big, right? The bolts are three times the size of this, three times the, the diameter and 20, 28 inches long and they have explosive nuts on them that you don't want to play with. My brother would, but I won't. So <laughs> he used to buy dynamite to go blow up trees as a teenager. Anyway, so here we are. We got the SRBs loaded. You can't see the, um, uh, the uh, mobile platform or the, the crawler. <clears throat> They've got the uh, external tanks now mated with the, the two uh, strut supports. <clears throat> and uh, now we're going to put the main engines inside of the shuttle in the, the shuttle assembly building. I've got different buildings around there. This has all kinds of valves and sensors and connections. You've got to bring two big pipes in for the liquid hydrogen and liquid nitrogen. The hydrogen comes in and cools the engine, so you have different plumbing there. And that's all got to be mated. This puppy has to be really perfect. Um, the metal here was, it's so hot, it's 5,700 degrees. They had to 
come up with a brand new type of metal so that that burner can could withstand the pressure and the, uh, the temperature. Uh, this thing gimbals. In other words, it moves around just before launch and during flight. So it's got to have mobility to it. There's all sorts of things that, that are involved with this, this main engine. They bring the shuttle over on the, on the carrier, put it in a, in a, a cradle like this, and then they raise that puppy up a whole bunch, <clears throat> bring it over to the uh, assembled SRB and, and external platform, lower it down. Now you see how this thing is almost the size of a 747, and you still have all of that space up at the top. I mean, everything they built was unbelievable to me. So there it is, all made it up. Uh, <clears throat> you got gang plants all around to fix things, to repair things if, if necessary. Hopefully nothing needs to be repaired. <clears throat> and now you have a payload uh, building that is assembling or is, is bringing in and putting into a, a carrier uh, the satellite or whatever they are putting up in space, Skylab in some cases. Well, it, was, it wasn't Skylab, but part of the ISS. <clears throat> and uh, a lot of that is all wrapped up, so very few people get to see what's in it. It's put into this, this carrier, brought out on a, uh, a payload carrier, just like the, the crawler is, that I'll show you. And it is raised up. This whole thing swings over to the platform. So you can imagine all of the weight that has to be on that hinge. Another engineering marvel. <clears throat> they bring that over. Well, here's the crawler coming out to the pad. Uh, the crawler itself is about 25 feet. See the people down there? 25 feet here. The mobile platform is about 30, so we're talking more than 50 feet. This thing, uh, the crawler can carry 18 million pounds. It's not loaded, so we're only talking um, a couple of million pounds. Uh, it takes 30 people to, make, to drive this thing out there. It takes uh, three and a half, excuse me, it takes six to eight hours to drive out there. I, I never figured out why they didn't, didn't do this in a curve. Yeah. It must have been, uh, well, I'll tell you that joke later. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, this thing is amazing. It, uh, it goes 42 feet per gallon of gas. So, all 42, not 43, not 41, but 42 feet. And so that means it takes about 457 gallons just to get out uh, to the, uh, the launch site. It's an all-day affair. <clears throat> well, you don't put the, the launch site down on the grass be because you've got little thing called hurricane, right? And you've got all sorts of stuff underneath here, especially the buckets for the flames to come out. So they've got to build that up. It means you've got to have a ramp. No escalators available. Five degrees. So all of the crawlers have to be built with hydraulic jacks, 16 on the uh, shuttle, uh, so that they keep that perfectly uh, vertical. So they've got to raise the rear end up five degrees and then lower it as they get to the, the uh, Technically, just another of those engineering marvels that you never think about when you're sitting there watching the shuttle go up. <clears throat> and you notice that this, it's waiting for the, the shuttle, uh, well, it's waiting for the, uh, the payload to get in so it can put it in place. And there it is, it's all raised up now. Okay, so here's Discovery. Um, this piece up here keeps the oxygen, liquid oxygen, from forming. Uh, um, ice crystals, which would be really big, and it would come down and hit the nose, and that would be another Columbia accident. So that all is all designed. This is the crew compartment. There's all kinds of umbilicals that come in, which are snapped away and, and fall back, and then are quickly shut behind a door uh, during launch so they don't get burned up by all the flame, because this is really hot. <clears throat> OK, so launch operations. <clears throat> so what are we going to do? Well. There's all sorts of procedures and all sorts of people in mission control. You've seen the movies, of course. Those are guys are all sitting there with, with the, the medical and the, the fuel and the, uh, just goes on and on and on. Um, um, at 31 seconds, the command is sent over to the onboard computer. So now the computer inside the shuttle is controlling everything. At 10 seconds, you get all these sparkles. You know, you've seen all those little 
hot things. Well, that's hot zirconium that's being shot by four of these little uh, solid engine jets. And the reason they do that is because any of the hydrogen that's leaking out, hydrogen is really small little pieces of atoms, right? So it's pretty easy for that stuff to leak out. They want to burn all of that off so they don't have an explosion and then have a big boom boom uh, when the shuttle would, would explode. So they burn that off for, for about uh, 40 seconds. 6.6 .6 seconds, then they open the valves and they start bringing hydrogen down through the pump. It also goes around the engine to start cooling it. And because it's so cold when it hits the metal inside that pump, it immediately vaporizes and starts building pressure. And the pump spins up to 30,000 RPMs within three seconds, which is really amazing. 37,000 in five seconds. All the sensors are measuring what is going on. If they got the right amount of pressure everywhere. And then the igniter is fired. And all of a sudden, you start getting a buildup. You see how the, the uh, nozzles shake. That's because it's a little irregular as to how the gas is coming down there. And so they've already gimbled the nozzles. They've tested it in that 30 seconds before to make sure that they're all working, nothing is frozen up. And then they spread the nozzles out so they're pointed as far as away from each other as they can so they don't bang into each other when you start the engines. The main engines are started 120 milliseconds apart. Uh, somebody figured that out, and I don't know the reason, but it sounds like a good idea. And then as soon as it builds up at 90% power only, then you start getting uh, that asymmetrical thrust coming from the, the angled uh, uh, main engines and starts pushing the, the shuttle over. And it literally bends the shuttle six degrees at the top. But it's a mechanical spring, so to speak, and the shuttle automatically springs back. If all the sensors read right pressures and all the other values that they need to, to meet the minimum standards for, then at zero, when it actually reaches the vertical, command from the, the shuttle fires the explosive bolts uh, nuts off <coughs> of all eight of the uh, bolts. And, and you're not going to stop the shuttle anyway with 7.7 .7 million pounds of thrust. But they don't want to do any damage. So anyway, it fires off the bolts. Now the, the shuttle is free. It fires the igniter in the top of the two SRBs. That fire goes all the way down to the bottom in, in a quarter of a second. So you have the entire SRB lit off. And suddenly, you have 6.2 million pounds of thrust coming out of the shuttle, the SRBs, plus the 1.2 million from the engines. It's going up into space, whether you want to stop it or not. At eight seconds, uh, it clears the tower and is uh, going 100 miles an hour. At one, one minute, it's going 1,000 miles an hour. At two minutes, it's going 3,000 miles an hour. And it's burning gas at seven tons a second. So <clears throat> um, now you've, you've also done the pitch and roll program, so you're pushing the vehicle over to the side. One point, uh, 124 seconds, the, uh, the SRB runs out of, of uh, 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 propellant, and so it's kicked off, explosive bolts fire, and they push away. So they, it travels, since it's going uh, 3,000 miles an hour, almost straight up, it's now going to rise and then eventually fall. The parachutes open up, and it's going to fall in the ocean, be retrieved, and, and then refurbished. The main engine is continuing to burn fuel from the external tank for eight and a half minutes. And it's accelerating because now you don't have that extra two and a half million pounds sitting on your wing. And as the fuel burns down, it gets lighter, it goes faster and faster. So by eight and a half minutes, when you get MECO, main engine cutoff, you've heard that. <coughs> uh, I'm assuming you listen to the show of takeoffs. Uh, now you're doing 17,000 miles an hour in, in a near orbital trajectory. Now, there's a couple of interesting things historically about this, especially if you have seen the, the movies. You know a guy by the name of Werner von Braun, the German scientist who was the genius that, that built the V1, the V2 for the Nazis. Well, I gave him a pass because if you don't work for the Nazis, you don't get to live. So, you know, that's how things go in, in old Nazi Germany. But anyway, under Operation Paperclip, he came over here to the United States with a thousand other German scientists. Fortunately, we got him. 
because all the rest went to the Soviet Union and did not have a good time. Uh, so Braun, von Braun, as, as they developed the space program, we had one shot rockets initially, and they would go up and then disappear in the, in the ocean. He realized if you're going to go to the moon, you have to have a whole lot of power, a whole lot of energy, a whole lot of fuel. Well, why drag all of this extra weight up uh, from empty gas bags and engines if you don't need it? So he developed the multi-stage rocket where the first stage would burn out, you'd throw the engine and the, ro and the, uh, the tank away since you have no more fuel. You ignite the second stage, and then the third stage, and, and maybe the fourth stage. That's what saved the space program. That's why we could go to the moon. That was one brilliant piece of uh, technology that was developed. Another one, if, if you saw the movie, was invented by a lady by, uh, by the name of Katherine Johnson. She was in the movie Hidden Figures, the black lady who got to go and work with uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Gilruth, I believe his name was. Um, it was the uh, it was the guy that played. Pardon me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So anyway, here was the problem. NASA engineers couldn't figure this out. If you, if you go straight up, you come straight down. If you are in an orbit, it's called an ellipse. There's a, an equation for an ellipse. Everybody knows that from geometry. <coughs> Um, there's also an equation for a parabola. If you throw, if I throw this out to the audience, it's going to rise up, slow down, and then come back down, thanks to Sir Isaac. But it's called a parabola. Well, the problem is, is getting a parabola equation turned into an elliptical equation. It's not that easy. NASA couldn't figure it out, but Johnson did. She was a very smart lady. And she was the one who was able to not only figure that transition out um, in, in orbital mechanics, it's called a Hohmann transfer, but that's when you're going from one orbit to another. I don't know what they call this, a transition from a parabola to ellipse. But anyway, um, she figured that out. She also confirmed the orbit of the, uh, uh, the mechanics, orbital mechanics for John Glenn's flight, and she saved Apollo 13 by figuring out where they needed to land. And of course, she became very famous down there. She was gone by, uh, by the time I, I showed up. But all that sort of stuff is, is very interesting because individuals are the ones, are the reason, just like Sir Isaac Newton, he wouldn't have calculus. Well, Euler may have, may have invented it. But um, we wouldn't have a lot of this high-tech stuff if it weren't for these really brilliant people. <clears throat> okay, so, um, it's actually a little more than that. So let's pretend that you are sitting in the command pilot seat. You're going to fly this, this thing to space. Actually, the computer is, but we'll pretend like you are. So we've taken off, and we're up. Uh, we've already launched. We're in space now. There's the SRBs. We're at 1,500 to, f to uh, 400 miles up, the upper range of the shuttle. Hubble flies at 360. Anything you want to stay in space for a long time, you push it up. If you want it to stay out there forever, uh, almost forever, you put it in a geosynchronous orbit, which is at 19,000 miles up in space. The Fleet Satcom satellite that I worked on was the first geosynchronous communication satellite that gave the president worldwide communications capabilities with all the ships. Thank you very much, Navy. <coughs> so um, you've got to park it way out there. That, that's a whole lot of energy. And the way they do that is they launch the vehicle in a highly elliptical orbit, not circular, but elliptical orbit. When it gets out to the top, they have a motor, a solid state, or solid rocket motor called an apogee kick motor. They fire that, they give them extra energy, and that circularizes the orbit. But once you're out at 19,000 with the shuttle, you're not going to fix anything because they can't fly that up. So anyway, that's some of the tricks that they, they use in orbital mechanics. <clears throat> also, when you're on um, uh, getting to orbit or you're on orbit and you need to move the spacecraft around, reposition it, and you have 44 different thrusters in the nose and tail. And they're just little jets. They use uh, nitrogen tetroxide and hydrazine. Nitrogen tetroxide is the, the, the um, oxidizer. Hydrazine is the propellant. Hydrazine has an interesting tech, uh, technical problem in that 
when it freezes, it shrinks. When water freezes, it expands, right? So if you put water in a bottle and it's not very strong, it'll, it'll explode. Hydrazine is the opposite. Discus was one of the satellites that was in, in work uh, down the hall for me when I was working on Fleet Sat. And they had a, uh, a, um, uh, he a heater that failed. You have to have heaters on these lines because it's so cold in space, 300 degrees below zero, things freeze up and hydrazine will freeze up. So you have these heaters using solar energy through the solar panels to keep these things warm. Well, one of these heaters froze and it, uh, it created a, a solid propellant in the line, but the hydrazine kept flowing over. So when it ba went back into the sun and heated up again, now that plug, which has been filled in and, and locked up as a, as a big rock of ice, now it failed and burst the, uh, the line. Well, a burst line is nothing more than a, a little jet. It spun up the, the vehicle, you can't fix it, so you've lost a $500 million satellite because somebody didn't check a, um, a heater. And you know, space just has all sorts of issues like that. I mean, it's very difficult to work in. Okay, so uh, we've got two pilots, as many as six other payloads. Typically, they only had uh, seven or less. Only one uh, mission had eight pilots. Uh, lots of sp living space, right? That, that's cubic feet. <laughs> that's not much. You've got three decks, the pilot and two uh, payload specialists sit in the, the flight deck during launch. And there was one mission that uh, Dick Covey uh, was on, my classmate. Um, and he said that they had canceled the day before. They went out. It was still raining. The next day, he thought they were going to cancel, but they, they were ordered to go in the space shuttle. So they all got strapped in. And it was a big hole. Weather hole was going to be probably some hours. So the guys in the back unstrapped and went to sleep. Now, Dick is with Joe Engel, the very first shuttle uh, astronaut. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're playing the game because they're the contact with mission control. So all of a sudden, they got la launch uh, approval. They had nine minutes to get together. The guys in the back are fumbling around trying to, you know, in a spacesuit, you're trying to get all strapped in. <clears throat> well, you're not going to stop the launch. So they took off. Miko started. And when Miko stops, right, you're not going to fire the engine until another uh, nine and a half or another minute and a half. All of a sudden, here's something in the back. This guy says, uh, it was lounge, uh, astronaut lounge. He says, wow, this is really cool. He looked back there and Lounge was floating around in the cabin. <laughs> he never got strapped in. <laughs> the only guy got, got fired, he couldn't bring him back. This is my favorite part of the space shuttle. Um, like I mentioned, I got to fly a simulator mission with uh, Bob Crippen and Joe Engel, the very first two uh, shuttle pilots. Uh, they, they only flew the the approach because on, on takeoff, well, they, they have different profiles, but they didn't do takeoff this time because it's all computer controlled. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, this particular mission, they, uh, uh, the mission control sim operators gave a, an undercast so you couldn't see the runway, you couldn't see anything, and they're flying the, uh, the computer around. All of a sudden, they have a failed MMU, the computer failed, so you don't have any directional control. So they're rolling out on final with nothing but clouds underneath them and no computer to tell them what to do. But they knew that they were on glide slope and, and, glide, uh, and uh, on heading before, so they looked at each other, and I thought, this is going to be interesting. And they said, well, what the devil? So they punched through, and all of a sudden, they're really steep. And I'll tell you about how steep this is. <clears throat> and they look at each other and say, well, let's try it. So they pop the speed brake real early. They're screaming down. and. They pull out, flare the, air, uh, the spacecraft, they land long, flies off, into, flies off of the runway and out into the, uh, the swamp, and the, the shuttle simulator just goes ahead and float, throws the, the, the uh, air, airplane down, and it, just like it was a real thing. So they said, we got it down, didn't we? <laughs> 2,020 different switches, circuit breakers, panels, displays, you name it. Now, I brought my Dash 1, every pilot has what's called a Dash 1, which is the, the pilot training manual for their air, aircraft. Uh, the bigger of the airplane typically is, it's a little more. But this was for the OV-10. And that's not a very complicated airplane, but pilots have to learn you know, pretty much everything in here um, and memorize a lot of the emergency procedures. 
the shuttle astronauts, the, the command pilot and the pilot, have a stack this tall of manuals that they have to learn. That's why it takes two years of training to make sure that they have enough skills to, to fly this vehicle. And they fly a thousand landings before they're qualified. They have a, a Gulf Stream II, which they take up to altitude, specially modified, it's got a speed brake on it, and they dive down with the gear down, and it's, it's stressed to handle this, and the engine's in reverse to, to simulate the shuttle. And then they get down to the runway, they have an instructor on board, and he says, when it's 26 feet uh, eye level to the command pilot, he says, go around. And that's a successful landing. They do many of those. So <clears throat> this is really fun. These, are, these were updated in about the 1983 time frame. It used to be a lot uh, coarser. Uh, this is the MMU. Basically, he flies uh, a box around a little circle. And if he keeps that box right there, then the computer is telling him exactly what energy to fly all the way down to touchdown. <clears throat> all right, so we got the flight deck. The mid deck, the lower deck. Oh, I got the wrong one here. Um, so you are at at uh, 115 miles. You're doing 17,200 miles an hour. You're over the Himalayas. You got 5,000 miles in 65 minutes before you land, and you hope that the computer is right because you're not going to touch the the stick for a long time. And so here's what happens. You've got to lose airspeed, you've got to lose altitude. The very first thing you do is, and you're going that way, you're going to turn the vehicle around, probably like this, and fire the Ohm's engine. If you notice, uh, you've got these two little engines down here, and then there's all kinds of little engines, 44 of the thrusters. The Ohm's engine throws out 6,000 pounds of thrust per, but this is the 200,000 pound vehicle. So it's not going to do very much. You're going to burn it for you're going to burn it for th for three minutes, and you're going to lose 200 miles an hour. Big deal. What about the other 17,000? As soon as you get the velocity reduced, you're going to flip the airplane over, spacecraft over, and you're going to start coming down at 18 degrees glide slope, maybe as much as 20 degrees, depending on your initial altitude. That's steep. And you're starting over the Himalayas. You're going to be at, at uh, 400,000 feet over Hawaii, 600 to 400. So the only problem is, if you do this, you're going to have all the heat up here. So you want to have this at a 40 degree nose high angle. So all the heat and, and uh, speed brake, so to speak, is right on the bottom of the airplane where all the tiles are. And by the way, the original vehicle had 30,000 tiles on it. This one, uh, after about four or five launches, had 24,000. Every tile is between a half an inch to four inches thick, roughly on the average or about six inches square. Every one of the 24,000 tiles is unique. It has its own number, it has to be handmade. Every one of them it takes uh, between, well, it takes about 10 days and 45 man hours to replace one tile. Typically, you would lose 30 to 100 on a mission. The worst example was when they had um, a serious issue. They had 4,000 tiles they had to replace. And this is the only thing that keeps you between uh, life and, and hell, basically. Okay, so you're at a 40 degree angle up. You're flying through 400,000 feet. <coughs> At, uh, you're starting to sense the atmosphere. Some of the air molecules are impinging, starting to heat things up at that, uh, at that 18 degree glide slope. Then uh, you've got a whole lot of altitude and airspeed to lose. If you do this, you're gonna drop the nose because there's no lift. If you do this, this is gonna start flying again. You're gonna skip out of the atmosphere, lose your altitude, come down, and eventually you're going to basically crash far short of the, the, uh, the uh, target. So you've got to have a combination of the two. So NASA has the shuttle do an 80 degree bank and a bunch of S turns like this. It's like if you put the hand out the window, 
when you're going fast. Four S turns. So you lose a couple of hundred thousand feet. At uh, 200,000 feet, you're still going at, at Mach 25, 17,000 miles an hour, but you're slowing down. At 150,000 feet, now you're starting to pick up and you're about 140 miles out. You're about Mach 5 and you're, uh, you're starting to pick up the TACAN. TACAN is tactical air navigation that pilots use. There are three systems on board for the shuttle, plus later on they had the GPS. So now the on onboard computer is not trying to put the, the vehicle into this big basket. Now it's got a, a specific target, the TACAN, at Kennedy Space Center that it's going to use for its navigation. <laughs> at uh, 120,000 feet, the ailerons, elevons, which are these flaps down here, and the rudders start becoming effective. So you don't need to push the vehicle just with the, the RCS, the reaction control system engines, which typically push the, the, the rear end, not the front. Now you can start flying the airplane like a glider, sort of, a glider that's really heavy. <clears throat> um, at 1,700 miles an hour, now the computer starts computing based on energy maneuverability. You've got airspeed, which is fast, you've got altitude, which is high, and you've got distance. That's all you've got. You can point the nose, but you have no engine to fly this thing with. So the, the uh, computer is figuring out what combination, this is potential um, energy, airspeed is kinetic energy, the combination gives you a total energy system. So now you're looking at all of the energy required to do this big circular path right down to the runway. It's going to manage the system. It's going to make sure you're not pointed too far away or too high or too low. So all the computer is doing is, is measuring that and putting that little ball in that space. 50,000 feet is when the pilot finally takes over. You've gone all the way from the Himalayas to 25 miles short of the runway uh, to uh, before the pilot handles this thing. Hopefully, Microsoft didn't invent the software. <laughs> so, pilot takes over 50,000 feet. That's you, right? <clears throat> um, so, if this is my runway, <clears throat> I'm coming, and we're looking down the top, I'm coming over here 25 miles out at 50,000 feet. I'm going to turn around, curve still descending, at 90 degrees to the runway, I'm now at 20,000 feet. Now, an airliner at that point would be about 3,000 feet. So we are way up there falling like a rock. Then we're going to fly it around at final approach speed when you roll out on final. Now you're at 10,000 feet. You've lost 10,000 feet and the last part of your airspeed, so you're four, 345 miles per hour on final approach, seven and a half miles from the runway, still at 10,000 feet. So you're coming down at 18 degrees. An airliner flies about two and a half degrees. So you're still steeper than snot. At uh, uh, 2,000 feet, now the pilot pushes the nose up and, and goes into a, a pre-flare maneuver. He's gonna slow the aircraft down and he's going to stop his decent rate down to where he's only got a two and a half degree uh, decent rate, still falling. At uh, 300 feet, eight, about eight seconds before touchdown, the gear comes down. Eight seconds before touchdown? But it's all automatic, as soon as you put the lever down. <clears throat> you cross the threshold of the thrun runway, the end of the runway, at 26 feet. Not 25.1 or 27.3, 26 feet. And then you touch down 2,500 feet down the runway, and by the way, by the time you, you enter the, the approach end of the runway, because this thing is nose high, it's pushing all the air, and you're starting to get ground effect. It's basically a cushion, just like you put your hand out the window, right? It's pushing you. So the ground effect actually aids uh, in, in landing the aircraft. You typically see really good uh, shuttle landings. Ground effect is one thing, a thousand air, uh, landings doesn't hurt. So you land 2,500 feet down the runway, you pop the drag chute, it comes out, the nose comes down, you release the drag chute so it doesn't fall on the, the engines that are very hot, would cause them to light off and burn. 
<clears throat> you put the nose brake down, you come to a full stop, hazmat comes out with the ground crew, make sure there's no hydrazine leaks, you come out of the cockpit and you're a hero or a heroine. Congratulations. That's the problem. So briefly, uh, let's talk about what NASA didn't do right. Um, I unfortunately was there in mission control with Dick Covey, as I showed my classmate who also was the hair of a repair mission. He was the voice of mission control. Houston, this is, this is Challenger. <clears throat> and uh, you know, Dick, I, I've got movies of him and he was just as, as distraught as everybody was. It was a major um, psychological episode for everybody at, at NASA and of course the nation in general. So what happened with Challenger? Number one, um, there were icicles about that long on the, the launch platform everywhere. There was ice everywhere. And the temperature was 27 degrees. The launch limit was 39 degrees. NASA wanted to fly because they were pushing to be a space transportation agency. Uh, their goal was to have 16 flights a year. The max they ever flew was nine. Typically, they would have seven or six or, or fewer, depending on the, on the, the missions. But uh, they, they really wanted to fly this mission, and uh, they tried to push the Thiokol uh, manager into uh, saying, yeah, it's safe to fly, and he wouldn't do it. And I know that because I called him up. I, I talked to him. He sent me his book. Uh, he says, we have not tested this vehicle at this temperature. We don't know what's going to happen. We will not sign off. So NASA flew it anyway, unfortunately. And so what happened is that those rings, those O-rings, shrank. Now, when the shuttle fills up, when the external tank fills up with liquid hydrogen and, and oxygen, it's on more or less springs, the mechanical devices that, that are flexible because the tanks shrink six inches with that cold stuff inside. So it, you have to have the, the ability to support that, uh, all that weight without it breaking and without it cracking and so forth. So everything about the shuttle is a major nightmare from an engineering standpoint, thermodynamics, mechanics, uh, astrodynamics, you name it. So anyway, the, the O-ring shrank. Then you've got 1,000 PSI pressure on the inside, 4,500 4, degrees, and so it pushes everywhere. You know, a, a balloon pushes, pushes all the way around, right? Uh, PV equals NRT, if you want to know the, the equation. So uh, that, that little sneak path became a channel for hot gas, and it hit that rubber, which is a gasket, just like in your car, and started melting it. Well, we didn't see this. this these were post-accident uh, uh, pictures because that would have shut things down before the uh, SRBs went off. We would have, sh well, we wouldn't have any capability here because with the SRBs, you're going to go to space, maybe. But that was another sign in the post-accident uh, photos that, that they said, okay, that was a major problem. So here's the burn through. Sadly, the position, radial position of the SRB where the burn came through was pointed right at the strut that holds the SRB to the external tank. There's only two of those per SRB, and it basically acted as a torch, weakening that strut. When that strut weakened because of the heavy dynamic pressure, this is a 73 seconds, so you're traveling just short of the, of the SRB separation, so you're doing about 2,000, 2,500 miles an hour. It crushed, it pushed the SRB into the external tank, which is a thin wall, probably uh, broke the hydrogen tank first, which is why you probably, I think, you see all the extra hydrogen gas mixing right there and burning with the rest. And then <clears throat> that explosion continued up, ruptured the oxygen tank, and hy hydrogen and oxygen are hypergolic. When mixed together, they explode. And so that, unfortunately, was the result. We think, well, this, this image is not very good, but there's one we think the capsule uh, was over here to the side. The capsule it was actually broken and pushed away. NASA found it. They found the, the uh, astronauts 
Three of them uh, had tried to get into their emergency uh, egress equipment at 46,000 feet. I just looked it up. Uh, time of, of uh, survivability is about five seconds. So they hardly add any time. More than likely, who knows what the compression did, but if they were still alive, then uh, they were still alive. At least three of them were. So probably they all uh, had hypoxic uh, symptoms, which means you just pass out. Uh, pilots go through al altitude chamber training, and they pull the mask. We pull the mask off and see what symptoms we have when we start getting hypoxic, and then eventually you just you fall asleep. So they never knew what hit them after the explosion. And if hypoxic uh, deprivation didn't get them, then the crash into the ocean did. Uh, could it had been prevented? There was something called an RTLS, a return to launch site, which theoretically you could punch off the external um, uh, SRBs, but nobody ever tried it. It was a very dangerous maneuver. Nobody knows, and I've never heard anything official from NASA, whether they would let this happen or not. <clears throat> but if that happened, then you would still have energy to go up and then perhaps come back around, but where are you gonna land? Uh, if you had enough to get back to to uh, the um, Kennedy launch site, maybe, but it's lots of supposition, so. Uh, Columbia was another, I think, a NASA failure. The external tank constantly had pieces of the uh, chlorohydrofluorocarbon uh, foam fall off, little bits and pieces here. That's what broke uh, pieces of the shuttle uh, ceramic tiles all the time. In this particular case, there was a big enough chunk that hit right at the leading edge of the left wing. And so when you came back in the atmosphere and that left wing is getting 2,500 degree uh, in, uh, temperature swings, now you've got basically a torch. Behind that is an aluminum uh, wing. And if it's exposed, then that torch is basically burning the aluminum, which it did. And then it burned into a hydraulic a system, uh, how much, probably quite a bit, it may have, may have even had the hydraulic system fail. Now you don't have any control. You've got a wing that has a, an asymmetrical uh, drag on it, so it's pulling the spacecraft this way. The, the uh, yaw system is trying to pull it back, so the astronauts probably would have noticed an increase in, in yaw uh, and firing of the thrusters to do this. But um, once you got that instability going, then the aircraft becomes unstable. And this thing cannot fly at any other attitude in, in the atmosphere other than straight and level. So it had basically catastrophic uh, structural failure and broke the whole thing up. It was going about Mach, at least Mach 10 at that point over Texas. Uh, with very high temperatures on the wings, and so there was no hope. And NASA knew about the, the carbon problem, the foam problem, had tried to fix it many times, but had not successfully done it just yet. <clears throat> so that's where it came off, struck the wing, and that was the end result. So we lost 14 people over 30 years. In war, that's not very bad but losing anybody is bad. Okay, I wanna finish with this one little exceptionally successful program called the Hubble. Um, the Hubble started in, in the 1970s. They wanted a space telescope to get well above the atmosphere so they didn't have atmospheric aberrations, clouds, rain, all that sort of stuff. Great idea. They were supposed to fly it in 1983. Budgetary problems, NASA always had budget problems. Technical problems, always had that. And then that delayed it. Challenger was supposed to be a bird that took it up. Challenger couldn't. So finally, in 1990, Challenger, or, uh, the Hubble, finally got <coughs> launched on Discovery. This is a big telescope. The mirror is seven feet, 10 inches wide. That's huge. And these mirrors are ground to high precision, very high precision. <coughs> It's as big as a bus, so it took up most of the, the cargo bay. It was very expensive to build because it took so long and they had so many things that they had to fix. Hubble does more than just 
look at a star and measures different things, so you have different kinds of instru instrumentation. It was put up at 360 miles close to the, the uh, outer region of the, the shuttle range, but s close enough so it could repair or be repaired if necessary, which was one of the things they wanted to do. And there were five missions, and the big one was done by, by Dick Covey. It was supposed to uh, be brought back by, one of the, by the shuttle and put in a museum. NASA says we can't afford it. And then they shut down the program and they can't bring it back. So maybe Elon Musk will save it, we'll see. Okay, so they put Hubble up in space. They turned it on, they took a bunch of pictures. I said, oh my goodness, we have a disaster on our hands. It was a major problem. They couldn't see anything worthwhile in the pictures. And, and NASA, the great space agency that had funded and, and put this whole thing on, uh, uh, on the map, all of a sudden had all kinds of dirt on its face. So they launched a two-year investigation. They couldn't figure out why, what was the problem with this thing. And they brought in an old head. Who were smart guys? Yes, the old guys, right? So this, this uh, old gent came up and he looked at the, at the images and he says, well, that's a spherical aberration, which in astronomical terms means the damn mirror ain't, ain't right. <laughs> it was supposed to be <laughs> ground down to these kinds of precisions, but the outer edges were flat. Now, when you make a, a, a telescope mirror, it's not flat, it's parabolic, right? Because the light, light coming down here bounces right back to where it's being collected. But light over here has to bounce back up at a, an angle to that same collection point. And that only happens with a parabola. So it's very complicated to grind a mirror perfectly to a parabolic shape. Well, they didn't do that. Why? Because they dragged out old instrument equipment to save money and somebody assembled it improperly. Now, I heard one story is that they, they assembled it with the English system and it sort of been a metric system. Well, I don't know if that's true or not. But they didn't do it right. So this guy says, well, that's an easy fix. All you need is a contact lens. That's what we all have, right? <laughs> well, I don't, but some of you might. So NASA said, OK. Well, they had to go back to Perkin Elmer and said, bad boys, you've got to fix this. You've got to take that error and make it exactly the opposite in your contact lens, which they did. And they put it on uh, Covey's shuttle, went up, took all the panels out, took out the parts that didn't work right, put in the new ones, and Hubble was perfect. This is an example. This is Messier 100, um, a nearby galaxy in our local neighborhood. It's only 55 light years away, but this thing is 107 light years across. Now, what's a light year? It's 5.88 trillion miles. There's 400 billion stars estimated to be in that uh, galaxy. And this, uh, this is similar to the Milky Way. Ours is about 100 uh, light years across. We only have, we're, a, we're a, a peanut. We only have 200 billion stars in our galaxy. And by the way, if you stick around for about two and a half to four billion years, we're gonna be married up with Andromeda, which is a pretty galaxy up there, <clears throat> a little farther away than this one, that's merging with us, and it's gonna eat us up. But it has a trillion stars. I mean, space is unbelievable. So now Hubble is a crowning success. What does it do? It confirmed that our universe is actually expanding. Cosmology, uh, Theorists are now thinking about all sorts of things. It's, it found that black holes were common in all of, well, in most of the galaxies. Some of them are even rogues. They're black holes wandering around in space. They have no galaxies around them. Don't run into those puppies, you can't see them. <clears throat> found the most uh, transient, high, the, the biggest um, explosion ever seen. Farthest galaxy, 13.6 billion miles away. Now 13.8, but James Webb thinks it might be 42 billion light years away. So think of a cue ball versus a basketball. And what's the, here's a math question for you, what's the volume of a sphere? I'll save you. 
4.3 times uh, r to the cube times pi. So uh, with one inch versus four inches, that's 113 times more volume if our universe is really 42. Now, why is that important? You'll see in the movie in just a second. Exoplanets, we now have found 5,200 exoplanets, not necessarily all supporting life. Some of them are super giants like Jupiter or bigger. Some of them are small, some are too close, too, too far, they're not in the Goldilocks zone. But we have a bunch of them that are in the Goldilocks zone that are fairly close to Earth. They have, they have carbon, methane, they could have life on them. And those are in our local neighborhood. My daughters think I'm gonna kill myself. <coughs> Uh, those are in our local neighborhood. We can only see local stars, about 2,000 of them, ouch, about, uh, oh, within 100 light years. And our galaxy is 100,000 light years across. And we've got uh, 10 or 15 galaxies in our local neighborhood and 100 billion galaxies that we think exist in the known universe, not going out at 42 billion. I mean, think about it, 100 billion, that's, uh, that's 10 to the 14th power. Okay, so, <clears throat> the guy that owned the, the shuttle, uh, the, uh, uh, the Hubble schedule decided he wanted to try an experiment. And so, since he was the scheduler, he says, I'm going to point the Hubble at the most empty region of space. We're almost done, by the way, so don't run away. In fact, we got door prizes, so don't run away from before that too. So he says, the emptiest region of space is where? And he put a team on it, and they spent two years looking at all the areas. You, you know how big space is? Well, they wanted something that was out of the galactic plane. If you're looking through the ga galaxy, obviously you're gonna see all these stars that are in the way, right? So you wanna go perpendicular to the galactic plane, and we're out on the, the far edge of it, so we don't have all that center stuff, big bunch of gases, clouds, and many, many stars. So they pointed at this pl uh, piece in space for three days, took all of these pictures, and they found 3,000 galaxies they never knew existed. And so they decided 10 years later to do this again at another area in, in space. And they did it for 11 days, and they found 10,000 galaxies. They did it again a few years later. They found another 5,500. These were so far beyond that nobody knew they existed. They had never been seen by a telescope before. So what is that? That's taking about a quarter of an inch at arm's length. That's the piece of sky that you're looking at, which is one ten millionth of the entire sky if you were to, to go this way uh, all the way around. Ten million times 10,000 galaxies and that's only to the edge of the current universe. We don't know what's beyond that. So that, uh, that basically is the crowning achievement of NASA. I didn't get to the stars. I keep telling kids, shoot for the stars. If you only land on the moon, then you're far, much farther ahead than somebody who sits on the, on the curb, like my grandfather used to say, spit in one hand and wish the other and see which one fills up first. So I didn't get to the stars, I didn't get to the moon, but I did get to fly with the, the astronauts. I did get to see a lot of great stuff. So you kids, make sure you have your goals and, uh, and keep at it. Now, if you don't make uh, the academy this year, go to college, do well in school because the academy particularly likes grad, uh, students in college who are doing great because they've already, always, already demonstrated that uh, they can work at the collegiate level. And from all these guys in the three different academies, I can tell you it's well worth it. Just the band of brothers that you have, these guys right here are my band of brothers. Uh, it's a great society to be with. Okay, I wanna show you a, a video and then we'll get on with this. Thank you very much.
100 billion, if you have 100 billion galaxies and somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 billion, excuse me, uh, most uh, a trillion stars, that means there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to the 23rd to 10 to the 24th stars in what we think is our universe, times probably eight tenths of those with planets around them. Think of how many planets there are that have advanced civilizations. And the problem is they're a long ways away. Um, I don't want to take any more time, but I will stay after if anybody has questions. Uh, we're going to have Justin come up and give uh, the finale here. I've got one gent, uh, uh, Wayne, you want to give a presentation on the, your, um, where you at, Wayne? There you go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, Justin, you got it. Thank you very much, folks. A couple uh, quick housekeeping items before we get into the fun stuff here. Um, last call. Are there any veterans in the house who do not have an orange ticket? Orange ticket. Raise your hand. Going once. Going twice. All right. And a couple people. Wait, wait, we got one over here. Anyone else? <laughs> 